Well, thanks, Kumar. Thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, and can I thank the RSIS for inviting me to uh, give you uh, uh, an address or a lecture this afternoon. And my uh, address this afternoon follows on from a very good session we had this morning. We've launched the Perth US Asia Center and United States Study Center in Sydney, our <coughs> annual uh, analysis of what uh, various peoples in a range of important countries in our region are thinking. So um, we're very pleased to spend effectively the day with the RSIS. Um, I'm pleased to be back in Singapore. Uh, the topic of the conversation is not Australia-Singapore relations, but I thought I should just make a couple of points about that relationship before I go into the chosen topic. Um, <clears throat> the Singapore-Australia relationship continues to grow and grow. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. To grow and grow substantially. Um, a decade ago, most people would have thought of the Singapore-Australia relationship as being simply an economic relationship. The truth is, it's much more than that. It's an economic relationship, but it's a comprehensive bilateral relationship, and we traverse the range of strategic, political, defence, military uh, uh, issues, uh, and it's backed up by a shared history. You only have to go to the Changi Cemetery to understand the shared history between Aust Australia and Singapore. You only have to come from Perth, as I do, to understand that the close connections and the close relationship. It's easier for, easier for me to get on a plane to come to Singapore than it is to go to Sydney. And there are more Singaporeans in Perth than in any other city in the world other than Singapore itself at any given time. But the Shanghai history, uh, the five powers defence arrangement, uh, the defence training arrangements which enable uh, Singapore to train its service personnel in Australia. From time to time, we might just as well give you the, give you the Northern Territory and make it easy on Shoalwater Bay. Um, so there's a, there's a, and we have uh, rare for countries, we have a three minister dialogue, the Singapore Australia Joint Ministerial dialogue, which has got foreign ministers, defence ministers and trade ministers. So it's unique uh, almost, I think, where that combination of security and prosperity. And I've been involved in uh, two or three of those conversations and they're frank and they're very um, invigorating and add to the strategic thought of Australia and, uh, and Singapore. And I had the great honour as Foreign and Defence Minister to deal closely and work closely with some of your very effective Foreign and Defence Ministers, George Yeo, and Defence Ministers Tio and Defence Ministers Ng. Um, always a pleasure, always dealt with, with civility and courtesy but always intelligent and productive and forward-thinking conversations. And our Australian relationship with Singapore, of course, is not just with Singapore. It gives us an entree historically into ASEAN. It gives us an entree into the East Asia Summit. It gives us an entree into our part of the world. And that's really what my address is about today, <coughs> the Indo-Pacific regional dynamics in the age of the Trump administration. Well, that's professorial or think tank talk for um, what impact might the Trump administration have on what we thought was a pretty clear forward path for our part of the world. Now, how do I define our part of the world? Well, as one wag once said to me after I defined our part of the world, so the response was, so you're talking about Hollywood from Bollywood? And the answer, yes, that's right. At the, at the start of this century, many people in Australia and elsewhere spoke about this century as the China century, because China was on the rise. China's going to be a, a great economy, a great power. China's on the rise again. And so people started to talk about this century as the China century. And then a number of people said, well, that actually sort of downplays the presence of other factors, including uh, the ongoing presence of the United States. There might be some rebalance or re-equilibrium as uh, the United States goes from being the sole surviving great power of the Cold War to one of two great powers, the United States and China. But uh, the United States is not going away, either economically or strategically. So we then saw the phrase, this, this is the Asia-Pacific century. <coughs> and that, in a sense, worked. It included the United States, it included the North Pacific, so it included China, Japan, Korea, uh, and included the rest of uh, Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia. And then Australian diplomacy, um, and um, I take credit for Australian diplomacy, has started to articulate the phrase Indo-Pacific. And the notion of the Indo-Pacific was all of the action is not 
just on the Pacific or in North East Asia. India is on the rise, ASEAN is on the rise, uh, and as a consequence we need to be looking not just at one ocean but at two oceans. What's occurring in the Indian Ocean? What's occurring in the Pacific? And so we started to adopt the phrase the Indo-Pacific and that sent a signal. Obviously it sent a signal to India that Australia was saying you know, India is on the rise as well, a country of 1.2 billion people with a better population demographic than China, the largest uh, parliamentary democracy that, that we have, um, and its rise, its trend, ri trend line rise is not as sharp as China's was, but my own judgment is that you know, by the, and there are plenty of economic commentators who uh, bolster me in this view, that by the midpoint of this century, China and India are going to be about the same place in terms of economic prowess. But it also was a signal to ASEAN, to Indonesia, to Singapore and ASEAN that things were happening in Southeast Asia, that things were happening in, uh, in ASEAN, in the ASEAN 10 and in the ASEAN economic community. I'm not one for lengthy quotes in, uh, in my um, contributions, but this is one of any number of, of um, quotes or, or studies which makes the point that uh, in the first half of this century it's not just going to be the United States, China and North Asia or India and South Asia, it's also going to be Southeast Asia or the ASEAN economies. So in 2010, the end of 2010, the McKinsey Group put out uh, a study um, and in one of its paragraphs on Southeast Asia it said the following, the booming cities of Southeast Asia account for more than 65% of the region's GDP today and more than 90 million people are expected to move to urban areas by 2030. This shift will support the continued growth of the consuming class which could double to over 160 million households by 2030 making Southeast Asia a pivotal market of the future for companies in a range of industries. Keeping pace with this growth and creating cities of a high quality of life will demand some $7 trillion in investment in infrastructure, housing and commercial space. By 2030, the continued growth of cities could be some $520 billion to $930 billion, could add, sorry, some $520-$930 billion to the region's annual GDP. So there are plenty of stats out there which will show you China's growth and, and the ongoing trend, which will show you India's growth and the ongoing trend, um, but not enough showing you that what is happening is dragging, in my view, in the course of the first half of this century, economic and strategic and political and geopolitical influences from the North Pacific, US and North Asia, China, down south towards uh, the fulcrum of the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And guess which two countries are nicely nestled there? Answer, Singapore and Australia. And so we are now essentially at the fulcrum of the great geopolitical spheres of influence uh, in our generation, in our lifetime, in this century. Um, and uh, we have to be aware of that, we have to be wise to that, and we have to take uh, the economic advantages which come from that. And so if you look at Australia, if you see things through Australia's eyes, Australia is a large landmass country, we're an island country and an island continent, but we're a small population, less than 25 million, and we're scattered around a half a dozen coastal population centres. So we don't have population critical mass. Uh, population counts for a fair bit, but it doesn't count for everything, and both Australia and Singapore show this, that you can actually be uh, a strong and top economy without necessarily having uh, the 1.2 billion uh, people that China and India have or will have or the 400 million people that some people estimate the United States will have by 2050. You can do it with a small population but if you're going to do it with a small population you either have to capture uh, as Singapore has, capture something as a commercial hub through which trade goes or you've got to become a great trading nation and an attractive place for overseas capital investment. And because Australia was the last port of call before New Zealand in the old world, we had to become not a hub but a great trading nation and an attractive place for overseas capital investment. So after the end of World War II, who were the great capital investors in Australia? They were the United States, Japan, Korea and then China. And ongoing with that was the United Kingdom 
foreign direct capital investment for all of the obvious historical reasons and also European Union. Uh, and we became a great trading nation, initially in wheat and wool and commodities, then subsequently in uh, minerals commodities, iron ore and petroleum resources, um, uh, namely liquefied natural gas. And those exports, post-World War II, those exports went to North Asia, to Japan, Korea and China in that order for uh, iron ore and to uh, Japan, China and Korea for LNG. Uh, and so we established two great export industries into North Asia and that helped build uh, obviously an economic uh, and a strategic relationship with countries in North Asia. Uh, Australia had a formal trade agreement with Japan 12 years after the end of World War II. So after a bitter war in the Pacific, this was actually remarkable that Australia could enter into a trade agreement with Japan and that opened up our, opened up our iron ore export industry to Japan. Uh, we were uh, the second boots on the ground under a UN Committee mandate, UN, UN Security Council Committee mandate for the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and we went to China uh, through uh, our then uh, Prime Minister Gough Whitlam in the early 1970s and formally recognised China with a one China policy at a time when it wasn't quite so fashionable to, uh, to so recognise China. As opposition leader Gough Whitlam went to China and said that that would be what he would do if he was elected. He was roundly and wildly criticised in Australia and elsewhere and nine days later Richard Nixon turned up with Henry Kissinger and did exactly the same thing. So Australia has been good at becoming a great trading nation being an early mover for important bilateral relationships and being an attractive place for overseas investment. We've, always been an, we've also been an early mover for regional architecture um, and for international institutions. So when ASEAN first formed, Australia became ASEAN's first dialogue partner. And who would have thought in the, 19, the late 1960s in early 1970s when ASEAN was formed and Australia became a dialogue partner, the first dialogue partner, that we would end up seeing the formation of the East Asia Summit, the most important part of the regional architecture that we now have. Uh, we've also been an early mover on the Indian Ocean Rim architecture together with Indonesia and with Singapore, uh, namely IRA. The first thing we did was to change its name from IRAC, which no one could remember what it stood for, Indian Ocean Association for uh, Economic Cooperation or for Cooperation, to IRA, Indian Ocean Rim Association. And so we've been an early mover uh, on what are going to be the key parts of a regional architecture which will work well for Australia and work well for the region. And so in Southeast Asia, it's the ASEAN Plus architecture. And as India rises, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, IRR, will become more important. Uh, it won't necessarily ever have the same trappings as ASEAN. Uh, there are too many countries involved in the first place, but it will be a significant influence in, in my view. And so when you stand back from that, what does a country like Australia or Singapore need to do if you're faced with that dynamic? Uh, from Australia's perspective, I think the two most important things that Australia can do uh, over the course of uh, the, the first half of this century is to raise the level of our engagement and relationship with ASEAN, both ASEAN as an institution uh, and, the, and the constituent countries of ASEAN, including and in particular Singapore and Indonesia, Malaysia and Thailand, countries with which Australia has had a long-standing relationship but to grow our relationship with ASEAN and put that effectively on the same comprehensive and sophisticated level as we have our current relationships with the United States and with China. China, our relationship starts as an economic relationship. United States, our relationship starts as a security relationship and grows to a comprehensive security and economic relationship. And we're growing our strategic relationship with China uh, from a low base on small steps. But as if, if you accept the, <clears throat> the rise of uh, the economies uh, in our part of the world, as I've outlined, then a country like Australia and other countries in the region needs to grow its relationship uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Indonesia and ASEAN. Um, I've seen more than one uh, economic analysis which has four great economies by 2050, not necessarily in, in this order, but uh, United States, China, India, India 
and Indonesia, and if they don't have Indonesia by itself, they have Indonesia and ASEAN. And so the second important step that a country like Australia and Australia needs to take is to grow its relationship with India to the same level that we have with those other two economic powers, current two economic superpowers, China and the United States, and grow a level of our relationship with, uh, with India to a comparable level. Uh, now, that's the... That's been the thesis or the analysis or my um, um, argument you know, for the last decade or more. Um, and nothing has caused me to waver from that view. Uh, but in the dynamic of nations uh, developing, in the dynamic of international affairs, it's always possible that things don't emerge as you expect them to. Countries, for example, have occasionally missed the chance to become economically prosperous. In the 1890s, all of the international commentary was that two countries would become great economic powers, Australia and Argentina. Australia took its chance, Argentina missed it. So it's always open for countries to miss their chance or to fail before they consolidate. So Indonesia might miss its chance, India might miss its chance, China might, uh, might uh, have a backward step, the United States might falter. I don't think on balance that any of these things will occur, but it is always possible that things don't quite go according to plan. So one of the things which um, uh, very many people were caught by surprise was the election of Donald Trump. Very many people, um, and I have to confess that I was one of the 99.5% recurring uh, analysts and commentators and academics in Australia who thought that Hillary Clinton would win. Anyone who tells you that they thought that uh, or they knew that Trump was going to win, be very careful and ask, ask for the documentary evidence in advance of, uh, of the election outcome. So people were expecting a Hillary Clinton win and that made Australia feel very comfortable. Why? Because we know from dealing with Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State that she has a shared analysis. She has an analysis not unlike the one that, uh, that I have just outlined, obviously from a United States perspective, but she was the one who implemented under President Obama in his first term the so-called rebalance or pivot, which saw a range of uh, security, defence or military initiatives, but very importantly also saw the TPP initiative which Singapore was an early devotee of and a strong supporter of. I can remember being in a hotel in, uh, in Singapore with George Yeo rabbiting in my ear telling me how important it was that Australia got behind the TPP because this was a really important thing and a really important matter to get onto. And George was right. That was at the APEC meeting which was held in Singapore in 2008 or 2009. So Clinton understood all of that. Um, and so Australia thought, well, we'll be pushing on an open door here. We'll be pushing on an open door. Um, elections being what elections are is a different result. So the Trump administration's formed. So hence the title, which you might think is my own, but because I'm a mere um, director and, uh, and uh, distinguished fellow of the Perth U.S. Asia Centre, is actually Gordon Flakes, the CEO. So what impact on that Indo-Pacific dynamic might the um, election of a Trump uh, administration hold? And who would know how long we deal with the Trump administration? Four years, eight years, or um, some time shorter than uh, one term, as some pundits uh, argue for currently in the United States. Now, if this, w if this works, excellent. My Indo-Pacific thesis, um, and the first time Australia used that terminology was in the 2013 uh, defence white paper, and we continue to use it, was of course predicated on, on a range of things which looked as though they were certain continuing, um, and I've listed some of them here. Continued growth uh, of stability of China, and gro continued growth of stability takes with it necessarily continued economic growth. So it is possible, and we've seen recently, a not unexpected plateauing of growth in China. You see this with developing countries and emerging economies, you know, spikes of huge wads of economic growth, and then when the country moves to being a more developed economy, you get a plateau at a particular, particular level, and that's what we're seeing in China. 
But given China's inter internal dynamics, is it possible that China might take a backward step or might fail at some stage? It, it's a risk. Um, I don't think it will occur, but it's, it's not something that is necessarily a foregone conclusion. When Xi Jinping wakes up every day, his worry is, how do I feed 600 million people who are moving from agricultural areas to the cities in China, and how do I feed them, and how do I make sure they're happy? Well, that's a big task in any economy, but it's a bigger task when you've got 600 million people out of a population of 1.2 billion. India's continued transformation to great power status. There'll come a time when more than just Modi believes that the time has come for India to not just be a leader of the non-aligned movement, but to be a great power. Um, but it'll take more than you know, one or two terms of a particular prime minister to consolidate that. I've always been confident that India will be a great power. Uh, over a billion population, a good age demographic, a parliamentary democracy, understands the rule of law, the law of contract, respect for intellectual property, wants to do innovative things, um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, uh, you know, a great power in its region and will be, in my view, a great power globally. So ASEAN's continued growth and centrality and continued regional cohesiveness. Now, what do I mean about, by, by this? No one would have contemplated that when the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization was formed back in the 1960s and when ASEAN started up with a half a dozen countries that we would see what we see now with the ASEAN related architecture. I won't go through all of it, but the most important piece of that is the East Asia Summit. Who would have thought that by now, each year, ASEAN would host the East Asia Summit, Pre presidents and prime ministers uh, once a year, uh, foreign ministers once a year, defence ministers once every second year, but that will grow to, uh, to every year, hosting um, eight other countries in a, in, a, in a summit meeting where the leaders can talk about security and peace and prosperity and economic growth. China, the United States, India, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and I've forgotten one, Russia the price that um, everyone had to pay for the United States coming in, Russia coming in as well. Australia doesn't have a particularly uh, developed relationship with Russia, but my instinct with Russia has always been that you're better off with Russia in the room than out of, out of the room. But what that does, uh, leaving, leaving to one side Russia, what that does is that once a year, and if you happen to be in the G20, you do it twice a year, uh, once a year, an Australian Prime Minister or a Singaporean Prime Minister can have a conversation with all of the key players in our part of the world. So from an Australian perspective, twice a year, if you include the G20, our Prime Minister can have a conversation with the Premier or the President of China, the President of the United States, the President of Indonesia, the Prime Minister of Japan, the President of Korea, the Prime Minister of India, um, and if we grow a relationship, the Prime Minister or, or the President of Russia that has all of the key players in the same room at the same time, courtesy of ASEAN centrality at the organisational level. And so the single most important change that we've made uh, in the last decade or so, in my view, in regional architecture has been the inclusion of the United States and Russia into the East Asia Summit, because it has all the key players in there at the, in the same time. Same, same room, same time. It's not Davos, it's a former uh, regional piece of the, the, the architecture. Um, now, I think it's important that that architectural centrality and cohesiveness continues. It's a separate question as to whether ASEAN is able to continue to proceed along the lines of ASEAN consensus. There's more than one issues in recent times which ASEAN has found difficulty with. So maybe a separate question for ASEAN as to whether the notion of consensus slash centrality continues, but from a global and regional perspective, I think it's, it's essential that the architectural centrality continues because that brings the key leaders of what will be the superpowers, three superpowers, at the invitation of an organisation. They're at the same level as everyone else and need to conduct themselves accordingly. Continued peace and stability in the region, despite all of the difficulties that, that we have since the end of World War II, 
the number of conflicts in the world and in our part of the world has plummeted dramatically, including with the additional recent uh, statistics of non-state actor terrorism. And so it's essential that that continues. And we don't want to put that at risk by miscalculation uh, or, um, or misjudgment, whether it's South China Sea or whether it's uh, North, North Korea. So the continuity of, of peace and stability and security in the Indo-Pacific is absolutely essential. And here, in my view and Australia's view, the Americans deserve great credit for, since the end of World War II, being that anchor for peace and security and stability in our part of the world. And finally, continued engagement in the Indo-Pacific by the United States. Now, it took some effort on the part of Australia, uh, Singapore and Indonesia, because they were the three main countries involved, to persuade the United States that they should uh, enter the East Asia, should join up for the East Asia Summit. And the starting point for that was the APEC meeting here in Singapore uh, more than nearly a decade ago. So Australia argued it, Singapore and Indonesia then cleared the way for that to occur through ASEAN and the East Asia Summit, then the 10 plus 6. So the US's continued engagement is absolutely essential in my view. Um, and that's one of the uh, issues which is up for grabs when it comes to uh, is the Trump administration proposing to continue that engagement? Well, Vice President uh, Pence's visit um, to Asia and Australia was a very good sign and a very good starting point for that. Uh, Secretary Mattis's visit um, to key uh, uh, Indo-Pacific countries was another good sign of that. But time will tell whether some of the things that we heard the president say during the campaign trail come to the fore in the course of his administration, or whether the fact that he's got a team in those key security areas, so uh, um, where, where certainly Australia has confidence in those individuals and other countries do, so whether it's Mattis, whether it's McMaster, whether it's Kelly, whether it's Tillerson, these are, these are uh, figures who, on any measure, are of the order of previous incumbents in those offices and those offices and ones that Australia and other countries can, can feel comfortable dealing with. So what are some specific concerns under the Trump administration? Um, well, I think the most, and, and I um, subscribe to the view that um, Senator McCain articulated in Sydney the other night when he gave his lecture to the United States Study Centre at Sydney University is that um, I focus more on what the president does, not on what the president says. Now, what the president says does have an impact, and I'll, and I'll come to that in a moment. But of all of the things that have occurred so far, I think the most damaging thing that has occurred as a result of the Trump election and the Trump administration has been the withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Absolute catastrophic lost opportunity um, cost associated with that. Now. Australia and other countries have toyed with the notion of, well, do we get everyone except the United States to sign up so we'll have a TPP sans the United States and we'll patiently wait for the rainy day when the United States signs up? I've always been sceptical about the ability to effect that, largely because very many of the countries concerned paid the price for changing what, they, what you might regard as previous uh, protectionist stand, standings or, or policy arrangements in their own countries, particularly relating to agriculture, and the price that they, that they paid for that, they saw a victory on the other side with access to the US market. So I think it's highly problematic for uh, a TPP to be struck up sans the United States. Um, but that's the most significant um, difficulty um, and decision that we've encountered so far. The undermining of shared values. Well, here it does actually matter what the president says, just as it matters what a prime minister of, a, of any country says. Because what a pr president or a prime minister says reflects on the country's standing, reflects on the country's values and virtues, its characteristics. Um, and uh, in terms of the public, whether a domestic constituency or an international constituency, more often than not, to the general public, what you say is what you're doing. So, as Senator McCain said in Sydney the other night, um, if you think there's concern about some of the things that the President has said overseas, well then don't worry, that concern is shared by 
very many people in the United States, including Senator McCain. But I do think it's, um, it is important, and I don't think it's, it's, not a, it's not in Australia's interest, it's not in Singapore's interest, it's not in ASEAN's interest, it's not in the United States' interest for the United States to talk itself down, for the United States' reputation to be sullied or trashed or, or, uh, or uh, um, lowered uh, in our part of the world. Unpredictability on the Korean Peninsula. Now here, I'll tell you a tale out of school. Um, last year, together with Gordon Flake, the CEO of the Perth US Asia Centre, I went to Seoul, where we were um, uh, launching last year's version of our, of our regional public opinion report, our public opinion network. Um, the current National Security Advisor for the Republic of Korea is a former Defence Minister, so he gave me the great courtesy of inviting me to have a chat to talk about old times and to talk about the world. So inevitably the conversation got round to North Korean provocation. You can't have a conversation with a South Korean interlocutor without talking about North Korea provocation. And part of the conversation was, do we need to worry about North Korean provocation between the election date and the inauguration between November and January, to which I said, no, no, you don't need to worry at all. You know, um, uh, Hillary, Hillary will win. Uh, she and Obama are, are at one on this. If anything occurs by way of provocation before the inauguration, they'll be in lockstep. It won't be a problem. So the National Security Advisor Kim nodded and said, yeah, sounds like a reasonable argument. Then I said, of course there might just be one possible advantage of Trump being elected, to which he looked at me, narrowed his eyes and said to himself, to date I've thought that Mr Smith was sensible and rational, but maybe I've been wrong on that. So I said, maybe the possible advantage of Trump winning is that he will be even more unpredictable than the North Koreans. And so therefore, the North Koreans won't be provocative because they won't know what the response will be. The North Koreans are the masters of provocation because they very carefully work out the calibration of the response. Now, if you don't know your counterpart well and don't know what the response will be, then provocation becomes a risky business. Um, and uh, unpredictability on the Korean Peninsula has normally been associated with North Korea. But now you've got three presidents involved. You've got a new and young North Korean president, a new president of the Republic of Korea, South Korea, not expected because 12 months ago who would have thought that an impeachment process would have occurred? And you've got a new unpredictable president of the United States. So uh, there's been a lot of work done on trying to work out the risk analysis and the predict predictability of the North Korean president. Um, I'm confident about the South Korean pre president, but what's the predictability ratio of the US president? Uh, and if you speak to our South Korean interlocutors, that's the thing which causes them most angst. Uh, and so if anything of an adverse nature is going to occur, maybe there's a higher risk of that occurring in the Korean Peninsula than has been the case for some time. A weakened NATO. Now my European friends always, uh, to use an Australian expression, get into me sideways because I never talk about Europe, so why am I starting now? But stability in Europe and the stability of, of NATO and the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation has, has been you know, a, a terrific force for good since the end of World War II. Uh, and the fact that you've got the European Union um, and NATO, European countries working hand in glove trying to minimise issues and disputes, work with each other, is you know, a terrific thing for Europe. Europe will never again see the spectacular growth rates they had when they were emerging through the Industrial Revolution and the like, so their economic growth is plateaued. Um, but they remain a very significant part of the globe. They remain a very um, well-contained, orchestrated, uh, well-disciplined organisation. Um, and there's comfort and safety and critical mass and economic strength in numbers. But despite... Um, an initial um, good visit from Mattis, and despite an initial good visit by the UK Prime Minister to uh, the US, 
um, whatever the judgment was made of the President's uh, nine-day overseas visit, um, there's no doubt that the last couple of days was a complete disaster from Europe's relationship with the United States was concerned. H who would have thought um, that we would now be seeing the German Chancellor, who currently is on balance to be re-elected for a fourth term, would be saying at the end of a visit by a US president in a beer hall that we can't rely upon the United States anymore. You know, uh, in the week of the centenary of J.F. Kennedy's birth. So this is not a good development for any of us because it means you can't necessarily, re necessarily rely upon a sort of a stable and ongoing Europe. Um, now, she wound back a bit from that, but there's clearly um, difficulties in the relationship between the United States and Germany, and clearly that difficulty is shared by a number of Germany's European partners. So causing weakness in Europe, causing uh, a focus on Europe, distracting from new and emerging uh, economies and period and, 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 and focuses of um, growing political and geostrategic power and influence is not a helpful contribution. And then finally, um, uh, the second last thing he did in, in, in Europe was apparently to put the United States uh, commitment to the Paris Accord on climate change into question. Now, I'd be the last person to say that the Paris Accords are going to be an answer to or saviour or magic bullet to our problems with man-made climate change, but it is an incremental step along the right path. And so the danger, of course, is that opens up yet another huge policy vacuum or huge policy chasm between the United States and the vast bulk of the rest of the world. So there are some um, specific concerns as if we didn't have you know, more than enough to deal with in any event. Um, sorry. So can I <coughs> um, just conclude this part of our session this afternoon by just making some remarks about um, how, how, how do I think Australia should engage or deal with the Trump administration? Because, and this was a question that broader Australian diplomacy was asked and was asking itself, you know, the day uh, of, the, um, of the election outcome. And my view was essentially this. We have to do two things. We have to now engage in what the Americans would call a full court diplomatic press on our engagement with the Trump administration at every level. So that means um, you can't just engage your traditional arms of diplomacy through your formal Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade or your overseas mission. You've got to, got to enlist a broader Australian diplomacy. So if there's a real estate agent in the Gold Coast who knows Donald Trump, well then he should be utilised. If there's a golfer who's got his phone number, he should be utilised as well. If there's a beauty queen contest who's got his phone number, she should be utilised as well. So an all-court press to find any entree into any part of the administration. And so anyone who knows Mattis is being utilised. Anyone who knows McMaster is being utilised. Anyone who knows Kelly is being utilised. Now, as I said before, the beauty of those three uh, is that they're well known to Australia, and in Mattis's case, he knows us very well. So that's a help there. But broader diplomacy has to be brought to bear. So that's sort of diplomacy 101. More importantly, and this was something uh, which not just Australia could take up, but also countries like Singapore, and you've seen Japan do it. Given uncertainty in uh, the US administration, by simply asking the question, this is a new administration, we don't quite know how this will unfold, this one looks a bit different than previous administrations. To me, it was the perfect opportunity, opportunity for Australia to go around the region to all those ports of call that I've referred to earlier, to go to North Asia, including China, to go to China, Japan and Korea, to go to ASEAN, Singapore, Indonesia and ASEAN, to go to South Asia, to go to India, 
and essentially say, you know, we've had an alliance relationship with the United States for 70 years. We know them very well. We've got uh, 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 tremendously valuable trade and, more importantly, investment relationship with them. We know their economy very well. So, you know, we need to work out how we're going to approach this. So what do you think about what we should do on TPP? What do you think we should do about what follows TPP if we can't get it up? What do you think we should do at the East Asia Summit when we're dealing with North Korea? The chance to go around the region, building those partnerships, building those conversations, and making sure that um, like-minded countries, like-minded uh, people are thinking about the way in which we manage this uncertainty. Um, Prime Minister Abe from Japan did that very well, and to his credit, Australia's Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who's here tomorrow uh, or the next day for the keynote address at Shangri-La Dialogue, um, and just as an advert for Shangri-La Dialogue, that's become one of the premier um, security dialogues in our part of the world. And last time I looked, the Shangri-La Dialogue had never been missed by an Australian Defence Minister. Uh, which reflects Australia's sort of investment in, in that dialogue. But Malcolm Turnbull has done a good job, um, visited Indonesia, gone to India, Abe has come to Australia. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity, I think, for countries like Australia and Singapore to double their efforts with their partners in the region to try and come to um, analysis and assessment about how things might unfold um, in, um, in the Trump world. I've also, my advice has also been um, there's no point us getting emotional about this. We've got to be cold-blooded and we've got to pick our mark. Uh, one of the worries that I have in the Australian context is that for as long as opinion polling has been done, support for the US-Australian alliance in Australia is anywhere above 70 per cent, 70 per cent support for that security relationship. There is a danger that if Donald Trump is defined in Australia as the alliance, that support for that will plummet. Why do I say that? During the election campaign, opinion polls in Australia had support for Hillary Clinton at about 75 per cent, support for Donald Trump anywhere between 10 and 15 per cent. There was a global Ipsos poll um, after the inauguration, which asked the question, what do you think of Obama? He had 75 per cent of support from Australians, and support for Trump was at about 20 per cent from Australians. So if support for Trump is transposed to support for the alliance, then for the first time since the end of World War II, you might have a very unhelpful discussion in Australia about whether it, makes a good, whether it continues to make sense to continue a military and strategic alliance with the United States. So that would be a, a most unhelpful development. So that means from time to time, as John McCain has done, um, as, as Angela Merkel has done, that from time to time, Presidents and Prime Ministers of particular, of particular countries have to stand up and say, well, I saw what the President said the other day. Don't agree with it. It doesn't reflect our long-standing values and beliefs, and frankly, I don't think it reflects the United States' long-standing values and beliefs. You should read McCain's speech, because the key message out of McCain's speech was the US is not just one President alone, and went to all of the institutions which form part of the fabric of United States' uh, endeavour over a, a long period of time. And I, I agree with that assessment. So thanks very much for your attention. I hope that's been informative and I look forward to having a conversation and trying to answer a few questions. Thank you.